Good morning and welcome to online worship at Lionel Lakes Community Church. We are glad you're here. How soon before a trip do you begin to pack? You know, like, what's your packing strategy? Have you ever thought about that? My wife, Amy, she'll pack weeks in advance before a trip. She gets really excited, so she goes downstairs, she grabs the suitcase, uh, she makes me check it for spiders, and then, you know, she throws all the stuff she needs in it, and then it, like, sits inconveniently in our bedroom for weeks. Which feels really dumb to me. Because she needs some of that stuff. Like, you packed your medication two weeks before a trip, so you won't forget it. But don't you also need to take that every day? It feels silly to me. But also, you know, she thinks about what she'll need on the trip and packs it right away so it doesn't, she doesn't think about it and then forget to pack it weeks later. Like, she brought the sunscreen to Mexico when we went there last spring. Like, that's a really smart thing to do. And when you're as pale as I am, you know, sunscreen is a very important thing to remember. And I didn't remember. I forgot about it completely. Thank God for Amy and her strategy uh, for packing. Because it may be unorthodox, but it helps her kind of move through life and realize what she might need and then pack it when she thinks about it. That way she is just so prepared for anything and everything by the time the trip comes. My strategy is a little different. Uh, I usually wait until the night before, which may produce some anxiety in some of you, but it's fine. I usually don't forget too much stuff. You know, I count out how much clothes I need for the, each day, and I get all my toiletries ready, throw them in a bag, I grab the phone charger, I zip everything up, and then I set it by the door. Bam! Everything's prepared and ready to go when I wake up. So I'm kind of curious about what your strategy is. You know, are you like Amy? Do you pack way in advance? Are you a last minute person like me? Do you have a list that you use? Have you ever thought about this? It's something to think about. You know, what is your strategy for being prepared? And maybe if we learn from each other, we can find better systems. Well, this month we're going to be talking about this idea of mission. You know, the mission that God gave the church to reach the next person for Jesus. And I think the first thing we need to do as we go on this journey of reaching people is to prepare, right? When we go on a journey, we need to pack and prepare. So I want us to hold that idea as we read through Luke's gospel today. You know, what does it mean to prepare to reach the next person for Jesus? What do we need in our bags for this journey? How does God provide for us in this mission. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Luke 12, 32 to 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, because your father delights in giving you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. Make for yourselves wallets that do not wear out, a treasure in heaven that never runs out. No thief comes near there and no moth destroys. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be too. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps lit. Be like people waiting for their master to come home from a wedding celebration who can immediately open the door for him when he arrives and knocks on the door. Happy are those servants whom the master finds waiting up when he arrives. I assure you that when he arrives, he will dress himself to serve. Seat them at the table as honored guests and wait on them. Happy are those whom he finds alert, even if he comes at the second or third watch. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his home to be broken into. You also must be ready, because the human one is coming at a time when you do not expect him. For scripture in, among, and beyond us, thanks be to God. I was really intrigued by this section of scripture when I read it in the lectionary, because normally the lectionary offers, you know, an entire story. And a lectionary is this book that pastors have that lists out the scripture for every week and kind of goes through the stories of 
the seasons. Uh, but this section was weird because it was an in-between of two other stories. You know, it's still all the same setting, like in the larger scope of the story of Luke, it's in the same chapter. But it's at the end of one scene and the beginning of another, which is weird. So I just I had to preach on it. So just before our text this morning, at the beginning of chapter 12, you know, we get to see our setting for this moment with Jesus and the disciples and the Pharisees and a crowd of thousands. You know, it says the crowd was so large that they were stepping and trampling all over each other. Jesus feels that this moment when people are kind of crushing in, like this is a good time to start teaching the disciples. And he does. He starts with a warning. He warns the disciples about the yeast of the Pharisees, and then the audience of Jesus' message starts to get ambiguous, you know, the intended recipients. He's talking to the disciples, but the Pharisees are listening, and so is this crowd that is pushing in. And it's after this warning about yeast that a man in the crowd shouts, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Which launches Jesus into this whole spiel on earthly possessions. He talks about building up treasures in heaven because time on earth has no guarantee. Therefore, we should not worry. God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the flowers. God takes care of all this stuff so God can take care of you. Then we get to our text for this morning. Be not afraid. You don't need stuff. God is giving you the kingdom. Place your heart in this place, place your heart in God's kingdom, and no thief, no moth, no person or event can cause you to be afraid. That's a radical message. It's as radical in the first century as it is today to say, don't worry about stuff and then don't be afraid. You know, Jesus is giving his disciples a mission in this moment, he's telling them to seek the kingdom. And I think that's the foundation of where our mission starts. You know, if we want to reach the next person for Jesus, it is because we have first sought the kingdom and we have experienced this kingdom that Jesus speaks about and we are moved to share it with others. Jesus then shifts the conversation to another parable, this one about being watchful. Jesus tells them to be like servants who are dressed and ready, servants who are prepared. For their master to come home at an unpredictable time and when they are prepared the master will return and serve the servants in the end the servants are the ones being blessed this is a huge twist do you, are you getting that this is this is kind of like a jesus flip you know in the story do you know what i mean when i say a, a jesus flip you know a lot of times in jesus's parables he takes a standard story and flips the narrative on its head and this parable is all structured around, you know, the master-servant dynamic that existed in first century Rome. And this master-servant dynamic was felt in every sphere of life throughout the Roman Empire. And so the audience is expecting the expected. It's kind of like when we hear the phrase, once upon a time, we expect to hear a fairy tale. You know, once upon a time, a knight saved a princess from a dragon. But when that formula gets shifted around, it can hit us in a different way. So if we hear the words, once upon a time, you know, a knight went to a castle to save the princess from a dragon, but instead the knight befriends the dragon, and they fly off, leaving the princess alone. That's the Jesus flip. Expect the unexpected when Jesus speaks. So when the disciples and the Pharisees and this crowd of thousands pushing together, crowding around Jesus, they hear this story of servants waiting for their master to come home. You know, they have this expectation of what will happen. Then Jesus meets them with the unexpected because the servants are doing their job. They are the lowest of the low in the society and the master is the highest of the high. You know, they are on opposite ends of this spectrum of social power, right? And the more servants a person has, the more influence they hold. And this particular master, you know, he had enough servants that they could stay up through the second or third watch of the night. So this was a wealthy person who carried a lot of influence, which makes the Jesus flip that much more shocking. You know, the scholar Joel Green writes, Jesus borrows from the standard images of the household in Roman times, but also redefines household relations. 
His most surprising, and no doubt to some outlandish innovation, is his implicit request that in order to identify oneself among the faithful in the household of God, one should identify oneself with the servants of this example. This innovation embraces even the authority figure, you know, the master and lord whose actions upon his return are themselves servile. Everyone is expecting to be the master or lord when Jesus is talking. You know, they have this idea that God will treat them like a king, but instead Jesus tells them to be a servant. And Green summarizes this point by writing, By serving those who are servants, the returning Lord esteems the humble and overturns the socio-religious and socio-political norms. It's like a double backflip. You know, Jesus shocks his this crowd listening by saying, you know, you need to identify yourself with the lowest of the low. And when you do, the master will then serve you. That's shocking. Seek first the kingdom. Be prepared for Jesus to show up and God will lift you up. Jesus is laying it out for these people. He says the God of all creation, the ultimate power and authority in the universe, wants to serve you. But you need to seek the kingdom and be prepared to see God at work. Seek first the kingdom. Be prepared for Jesus to show up and God will lift you up. And then I just have to add on the, last, the next verse because I just love it so much. In verse 41 it says, Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? And in my head, I can just see Jesus smiling a knowing smile in that moment because here we are, 2,000 years later, still reinterpreting these words for today. We don't have the same Roman household dynamics that existed back then, but we still understand the spectrum of power and wealth, you know, who's at the top and who's at the bottom. We still know the fear that ebbs and flows as anxiety and worry for force us to ask ourselves, do I have enough? Do I have enough food, shelter, money? Can I afford insurance, school supplies, diapers, loan payments? The story of fear that surrounds scarcity is still present today. And Jesus continues to tell us, do not be afraid. Seek first the kingdom. Be prepared to find Jesus in the unexpected, and God will lift you up. I think this seek the kingdom, be prepared for Jesus, and God will lift you up flows down in a lot of ways. You know, I picture a lake at the top of a mountain with streams coming down on all sides. You know, everyone takes this idea and applies it to their own context. And one place where I've seen that is at Storm Camp. So for those of you who haven't heard of this, you know, Storm Camp is the youth church camp that I help with every summer. And this ministry has a very specific mission. To work and to worship and to serve Jesus by serving others. That's it. We take this idea of seeking the kingdom and being prepared and ride the river of serving Jesus by serving others down the mountain. And that role of servanthood is critical at Storm Camp. And I've had the pleasure of seeing this promise that Jesus makes of God lifting people up play out again and again. Because at Storm, we do a lot of different projects. You know, we scrape and paint houses. We weed gardens, move rocks, scrape and paint sheds, spread mulch, mow lawns, scrape and paint garages, repair fences, build decks, haul brush, cut down trees, scrape and paint decks. We're sort of a jack-of-all-trades when it comes to projects at Storm Camp. And the way we structure camp is, is we take all the, the people that come and we split them into what we call TIM groups, which stands for Teams in Mission. And our mission is to serve Jesus by serving others. So all these churches come and they bring their youth and we break them up into groups of five youth and one adult where they don't really know each other. And then we send them out into the community to different projects that we've prepared for them. And I've been able to serve at almost every leadership role during camp. You know, I've driven teams around. I've led groups of teams called major groups. And I've checked out jobs. I've prepared tools. I've preached. And I've done a lot of the administrative behind-the-scenes work. 
And one year when I was a major group leader, so I was in charge of, you know, three or four different Tim groups, I was preparing to build a ramp at a person's home who had recently started using a wheelchair. Have you ever built a ramp before? It takes a lot of preparation, and I went to school for biblical and theological studies, so my knowledge on building ramps was rather lacking. There was no psalm that tells you that the slope of the ramp cannot exceed the ratio of 1 to 12, and there must be, you know, 5 feet of ramp for every 30 inch rise. So I felt a little unprepared. And another great thing about Storm Camp is that we often serve people who are unable to pay for things themselves. So we end up paying for, you know, paint, supplies, and lumber, which is what we did for this pr project. So me and my team were at, you know, Home Depot buying lumber on the list that I had prepared that I did my best to prepare. Remember, I'm a Bible nerd, not a carpenter. And I never built a ramp, but a friend of mine that was also at Camp Brad helped me draw up a schematic. And the driver of the group had experience building decks, which is, you know, why we gave this group the job to build a ramp. So while we were all standing in this aisle, grabbing pieces of wood, you know, one of those old guys who gets a job at the hardware store for fun showed up. Uh, we told him who we were and what we were doing. You know, we're storm camp, we're serving Jesus by serving others. And today that looks like building a ramp. He asked, what type of screws do we need? And I said, that's a great question. Did you know there's like five different types of screws? So he looked at our list and added two or three things to it that would make the job easier. He rang us up, gave us a discount, and wished us well. The team arrived at the job site. Uh, it was a trailer home, and on the side of the trailer home was this old, rotting porch. And so they began to tear that apart, and they began to dig holes with the post hole digger for the ramp post to go into. Uh, and I remember this project because it seemed like a lot of stuff went wrong. You know, when you start taking stuff off the side of a building, you usually find something worse beneath. And so this person's home had rotted wood beneath the rotten porch on the, what's called the ledger board. And luckily the driver knew how to put on a ledger board because that's what you connect a deck to. And he knows how to build decks. And so it was another, you know, quick trip back to Home Depot saying hi to our friend and saying we need this board too. And then at lunchtime, you know, the batteries for their power tools began to run out, so they called me. Because when there's a problem on the job, they call the major group leader, and that was me. And I was coming out to bring them more batteries. And when I arrived, I found out that a neighbor had stopped by, asked them what they were doing, and they said, we're helping build this ramp. And, he sa and they said, but we have to take a break because our power tools ran out. And so he went home and got his power tools and brought them back. And then the neighbor even hauled the old rotten boards away for us. And later in the afternoon, you know, the city inspector came by to see the progress. Did you know you need a permit to build a ramp? He also dropped off ice cream for the group. So by the end of this two-day job, this group of teenagers and one really tired adult had dismantled a porch, replaced a ledger board, dug post holes, poured cement, and built a ramp. So that this person who suddenly found themselves in a wheelchair could get in and out of their home. Do not be afraid, little flock, because your father delights in giving you the kingdom. The kingdom has already been given. Everything is already packed. We just need to become aware that God has provided us with all that we need. It's a very liberating feeling to realize that you are perfectly capable right now. I've seen it happen time and time again. You know, God told this group of people who have never built a ramp to go serve somebody by building a ramp. And all along the way, God provided expertise and experience and materials and ice cream to make it happen. Seek first the kingdom. Be prepared for Jesus to show up in unexpected ways and God will lift you up. Our mission in Lionel Lakes is to reach the next person for Jesus. Are you prepared? Are you seeking God's kingdom? If you aren't, that's okay. I want to help you feel prepared to become a servant 
of the kingdom because I know that God is at work in your life. And God is going to show up in ways that you never imagined. And we will be humbled together and we will be encouraged together and we will be uplifted together. And the God of the universe will remind us again and again that we are beloved through this work. So let us seek first the kingdom. Let us be prepared for the unexpected, and let us be watchful for the ways that Jesus is going to constantly show up in our world. And when that happens, may we be lifted up together, and may we remember that our mission is to reach the next person for Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. God send you, the Spirit fill you, Christ go with you, and you with Christ always and everywhere. Go in peace.